Hello, and welcome to Contracts Over Coffee, the podcast where we talk about all things contracting while sipping a delicious coffee beverage. I'm your host, Ann Baker, Senior Director of Partner Marketing with iCertis. And with me today, I'm pleased to have Jane Allen, a principal at PwC in their advisory practice. Welcome to the program, Jane. Thanks, Anne. Thanks for having me. This is fun. And 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 I don't have to be sheepish about drinking my coffee during a meeting. So this is great. <laughs> no, drink away. Drink away. Well, we like to start off this podcast the same way with all of our guests, asking them the question, Jane, what is your story? Well, I'm a Northern California Bay Area native, which I feel like is rare these days. Um, And my story is I graduated from UC Berkeley, um, started at a boutique litigation support firm. And so if I relate it back to this world of contracts, I vividly remember, and and I would say I started my career in e-discovery before there was an E. And so everything was largely paper-based and maybe if you were fancy microfiche or microfilm initially. Um, And one of the things that comes to mind is a project where we had I can't even imagine boxes and boxes of paper of old handwritten water rights contracts and actually going through some of the clauses to to match up to some of our clients' assets and areas and whatnot. And so it's interesting and ironic today to be talking to you about contracts, but certainly in a much more technology sort of advanced and automated world. But um, since then, I joined PwC. I've been here for 16 years. Um, And again, as you mentioned, a principal and specifically in our advisory cyber privacy and forensics practice. Um, And you can imagine uh, contracts um, is key for a lot of what our clients are doing when you think about third party risk and managing that, updating them for legal context, changing regulatory requirements and such. So it's uh, it's never gone away. (laughs) It's interesting to hear how much, you know, contracts have changed since you started with them, getting paper cuts. And uh, and it's kind of interesting. uh, to, to see how, how much they are applying across organizations today. Every aspect of an organization is getting governed by contracts. And, and so you know, with that in mind, what do you think is the biggest challenge with contracting today? Gosh, um, you know, it, it's, it's ironic, again, thinking back there in terms of what has been solved and what still, you know, is still a challenge for, for clients. I would say for today, certainly the volume of contracts Um, with all entities, right? So your key business partners and and everything else, I would say is even more prevalent than ever. More and more companies, there's no way you're doing business without key contracts. I mean, it's critical to how you're doing business Um, and the volume of the contracts. If you think about how critical that is to business, what's still a challenge and what's going on today is, is how am I really harnessing the value out of those contracts are they able to adapt to where our business is going in the right way with the right partners? And oh, by the way, are the terms current for what we need? If you think about things like LIBOR changes, data use, privacy, cyber requirements, data retention or disposition, and all those things built in the contracts, um, have they been able to move as swiftly as companies need to? And I think the answer, unfortunately, is typically no still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And getting just the insight into all those different components and every contract at an organization, you know, like as big as PwC, for example, can be super, super complicated and, and, um, and critical. So where do you think contracting is going then? Where, where is that headed? Well, clearly I would say it, it was already headed to companies, I would say, biting the bullet or those that had sort of kicked the can over time of, okay, we need to think in a much more digitally advanced manner. I mean, certainly I sure this is a, a shining example of where the technology is advanced, but people really biting the bullet and saying, okay, we got to do the hard work so that we can reap all the advantages afterwards. So clearly if folks haven't already, and believe me, it's still out there, digitizing your contracts which sounds so obvious, but you know, if you do have contracts that last for a long time and have been around for a long time, that, that, that's, that's an effort. Um, but really getting it into something that adds, I'll say, workflow and transparency across all the business units that touch contracts for the business and recognizing this is a critical corporate asset and function as to how you do business. And let's make sure that we're agile, we're up to date. And by the way, we're reaping all the analytical capabilities that are available at tools like iCertis and otherwise today 
to do business more quickly or to change business? Or if you're going to make a deal, can you move quickly enough to know what you have in all your contracts? And frankly, leverage that to your um, advantage in terms of how you set up the contracts and in buying and selling power and such. Um, there, there's so much to be said for that that I think is still sort of a gap where companies just aren't there yet. Yeah, I think I mean, we're certainly seeing, and and some some in some cases the pandemic has made contracting have a bit of a moment because, you know, as as things happen, people immediately turn to their contracts to look for insights and information um, on how to react, and and that's why I think we're seeing contract lifecycle management in general have such a. a, a high interest this year because um and gartner even put out their first clm magic quadrant this year and i think it's because you know really people are starting to understand how much data and information is contained within those contracts that if they can quickly access it and surface it up they can just make better decisions and um i know working with you know organizations like pwc that can help them analyze that data and organizations like isertis which can help them digitize and quickly surface all that information um, is is really becoming more and more important, not just this year, but I think going forward as contracts do become a system of record for organizations. So um, we talked a little bit about the challenges with contracting and where you think contracting is going. Um, what's one contracting tip you wish every person knew? Gosh, um, a tip. Well, one of the things, uh, this is going to sound so self-serving, um, but, but it is the reality that companies are looking at and are considering these investments, especially in technologies like iSertis and whatnot. But, but frankly, I hate to say skimping up front uh, for the work that's going to really pay off in the end in terms of really capturing your ROI, not only immediately, but for years to come. And mm -hmm. really the way to do that is, okay, it's not just buying the technology and turning the lights on and, okay, everything's going to be fixed. And I think people know whatever the technology is, that's not normally what happens. But the way budgeting and I think understanding, people really need to see that you need the technology and frankly, a, a services organization that can really help you make sure that we know the key users um, of these programs, which again is, is procurement, it's legal, it's sales, it could be many, many parts of the organization and really understanding how they use that, um, making sure the configuration and workflow um, is configured to your industry and the way you do business, including the reporting and dashboards and such at the end, right? And really helping you get there and including the change management aspect, right? I, I think that's key. And change management, if anything, is the one area I see folks skimp the most on recognizing, yeah, 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 I understand. But that I think is the most impactful of getting people to adopt and use the technology right away and reap the benefits right away. Um, it's not rocket science, but time and time again, that's where we see that folks are skimping. So, you know, my my tip is, you know, it, you skimp up front, you don't get it on the back end, right? And it's not to say it needs to be this overly um, packed um, engagement up front, but there's smart ways to leverage the combination of firms like ours together, again, to make sure you get the payoff on the back end. Yeah, they have to do the work up front. I mean, time and time again, we've seen customers that work with us and our partners to really use this whole move to CLM technology as an opportunity to evaluate their contracting processes and lay out those workflows and how they'd like them to work. If they do that up front, I mean, the time to value and the ROI they're seeing is so much greater than if they just try to put it in place and hope it hope it works. Um, it's amazing yeah. just the basics that folks can't do. Like mm -hmm. uh, I still work with a lot of attorneys who will be embarrassed that I can't find that contract. I need to go email my law firm or I need to go email the other party to see if mm -hmm. they've got a copy of the contract. Mm -hmm. Um, or they don't even know, well, how much business are we doing with this entity? They're not even sure because they might have five different repositories, you know, scrolled away around the company. And so, it, I mean, it's some of those basic things, but it, as you point out, even the, the time to value, it, being able to kind of have that one transparent site workflow, whatnot, I mean, it, it shaved so much cycle time for some of our clients. They, they rethought how they even engaged many of their business partners. Um, so it's amazing what it can do. Yeah, and I think you, I mean, because contracting impacts every part of an organization, you really have to look at it almost at each department level. Like, 
how sellers need to manage contracts is going to be different than how your procurement team might need to manage contracts or how your legal team is managing contracts. And so you do have to almost look at those processes on a department by department level, and then also how you'd like them to work organization wide so that the departments can, you know, interact and contracts can flow seamlessly between them. And um, it's just a really, you know, fascinating space. I will say when I started it, I started as people were like, oh, contracting, like, good luck. And there is always that uh, feeling of contracts are hard, you know, and they shouldn't be. And if you have some of this technology in place and you lay out some of those processes, it can actually be a real advantage and a differentiator for a lot of companies if they can do their contracting quickly and very efficiently. So just to add one more example um, in the deals context, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it, especially at a time where all parties want to move very, very swiftly if they do want to conduct a deal. And the amount of manual time I still see across all industries of people hand reading contracts is amazing. And I think there's a little bit of nervousness of trusting newer technology like machine learning, natural language processing and AI. But it's being used, it's being used so effectively. And again, the cycle time, I mean, it's taking months in some cases off the time it would have been to have all this eyes on contract review. And I mean, the technology is already there. It's, it's proven, it's effective. And so it's just, you, you hope that people are taking advantage of this or should more. Yeah, like, well, I agree. And, and so what do you think people would be surprised to know about contracting? Surprise. Well, I mean, I think I've touched a little bit. It's just one, how much antiquated work with all due respect to those out there doing it um, <laughs> is still being done today. If I think back to, you know, rooms full of, uh, you know, temporary employees and, you know, contract JDs reviewing, uh, you know, contracts in, you know, eyes page by page and making notes and putting them in different piles. <laughs> some of that is still going on. And so to me, that that part is surprising in terms of the, the manual ad hoc aspect that's still going on. Um, and again, th that folks aren't reaping some of the benefits of the technology that's available to them through tools like iCertus or even in small ways of RPA or otherwise. It's, um, again, it's something that's been out there and um, more people should be taking advantage of. Yeah, yeah, and I, like I said, I think, you know, the move to remote work and not being able to walk down the hall and have someone sign a contract manually has led people to kind of evaluate what they're doing uh, right now in terms of contracting. And, and uh, you know, I'm pretty hopeful that, like, we're going to just continue to see a lot of growth come from this area um, over 2021 and, and beyond. So shifting gears a little bit, though, uh, Jane, we talked a little bit about contracting and what people would be surprised to know about contracting. But what would people be surprised to know about you? I guess, um, you know, maybe I am a bit of a person of um, extremes to some degree, right? In my in my job, um, in my client work and things, um, I, I'm such a huge proponent of finding different ways to leverage technology, right? And I'm excited by different advancements. I spend spare time reading about different kind of things and play with new apps on my phone all the time. And, you know, our practice works very broadly in the legal realm, also in cyber breach and computer forensics and things. And so I, I love all of that. At the same time, some of my favorite tasks uh, or uh, I'll say hobbies are like low, low tech. I love to go running outdoors. You just lace up your shoes, put on some sunglasses and it's just you in the outdoors. I love to hike. And even as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm realizing, you know, I still use analog paper <laughs> um, to kind of write things down. And mm -hmm. it seems silly. And there's so many different fancy note taking things, but there's something to me about the tactile piece of it. So I don't know, I guess maybe the running part and the writing part, um, it, it seems kind of silly. But for me, that seems to work just to have the balance of those two. Um, so yeah. it's not that interesting, but I, like to me, I, I, I find it ironic, I suppose. I think, you know, I mean, it's interesting. I feel that way too. Like the, uh, we're on, we're on so much, uh, you know, these days with work that um, having that balance between like the simpler things and, and, you know, writing something on paper or going out for a run outside is really helpful and nice just with all the just constant being on and, and, you know, dealing with the technology and, and not that we don't love it because we're in it every day, but yeah having those escapes to something a little simpler and um, is nice too. So that's a good balance. 
Uh, so my last question for you today, Jane, is is what what inspires you? I would say, and just reflecting that we're all in this situation, the pandemic, um, and and we could all probably gripe all day about different struggles, either ourselves or the world at large. Um, looking at the glass half, the, oh, the coffee cup half full. Um, <laughs> You know, it really, it's been amazing to learn from different people in different ways, just how resilient um, people are. And that's been inspiring to me. Um, I did some interviews actually earlier today with some college students. Um, you know, the college experience has been ripped from them and they're sitting, you know, in their parents' bedroom or wherever they are right now. And just how resilient some of those folks are or seeing my daughter and how she's adapted so well in this environment. And she misses her friends because she's still virtually at home or even out in society, what what folks are dealing with and whatnot and just how resilient people are. Um, and, and I would add on to that, you know, with the election around us, you know, politics aside, it's been happy to see sort of what seems to be a renewed civic engagement, which I hope will stick long beyond just, you know, this year's presidential election, just folks wanting to get involved and and voting, but taking the time to learn about that beyond that, but all the propositions and things. So for me, all those kind of things inspire me and give me hope um, in a time where I know we're all frustrated and dealing with different struggles that um, people are pretty amazing. So it's 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 been good to kind of focus on those aspects. Yeah, I love that. I I do think right now, uh, certainly during this period, people are looking for little bursts of hope. And um, and there's just been so much, you know, sadness and just change and things that people are having to deal with. But, uh, you know, in those darkest periods, we see a lot of new innovation and new opportunity and people being like super creative, sometimes because they're forced into it, but sometimes just because it's a, a moment to rethink how we're doing things. And so I totally agree with you that that resiliency has been really, really nice to watch. Um, and having you here has been very nice as well. So thank this you, Jane, for, for taking the time. I really appreciate uh, the conversation and the candor. And uh, for our audience, I'd love to tell them to definitely check out PwC's advisory practice and and um, visit our partner page at iCertus.com to learn more on how PwC and iCertus work together to help uh, bring contract intelligence to companies worldwide. Thanks again, Jane. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sam. Thanks.